So uh, good afternoon. My name is Jermaine Dennis, and I am the Special Collections Reference Librarian here at the Alexandria Library's Local History Special Collection Branch. I would, like, I would like to extend a warm welcome to you all for gathering with us here for the first iteration of the Community Scholars in the Parlor discussion series. On behalf of the library and our executive director, Rose Dawson, our program sponsors, and community members who have collaborated to produce this event, I would like to express gratitude for everyone joining us in person and virtually on Zoom. Before we get started, I would like to bring up Library, Alexandra Library Deputy Director, Louis Labra, to share his remarks on behalf of the Alexandria Library's Director, Ross Dawson. Louis. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Rose sends her regrets, but uh, she has a uh, child who's a track athlete at BCU and um, have a track meet this weekend. And since she is a senior, uh, Rose did not want to miss one of her last opportunities to see her perform. Uh, but she did ask me to speak with her instead. So um, thank you for coming to the uh, Community Scholars in the Par Parlor Program. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the uh, Washington Express and the Alexandria Social Responsibility Group. Um, as many of you um, know, this is the 85th anniversary of the Alexandria Library sit-in. Um, in August of 1939, we had five brave young men come into this library, which was at the time the only public library in Alexandria, um, to stage a sit-in um, because they were not allowed to use the library or to be in the library. Um, I can only imagine the bravery that that took and we'll be celebrating um, that legacy of courage throughout this year. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Some dignitaries in the crowd, um, Blake Wilson, um, African-American research historian. Thank you for coming. Um, Lou Whitting. Um, Lou right here. Uh, with the Social Responsibility Group. Um, Steve Martin, um, who I had a brief little chat with. He's related to one of the sit-in participants and he was telling me he, he could only imagine um, the bravery that it took uh, for them to participate in that event. Um, Tiffany Pache, who's with the ACRP, she's the ACRP coordinator. And Gretchen Bulova, Director Oha, thank you for coming. Um, the final thing that I'll uh, say um, is an event that I'm directly coordinating and I do hope that you attend this year on September 14th, we'll be doing our second annual Black Family Reunion. Um, if, if you have not participated, what we do in that, um, it's our way of trying to encourage the Black community to bring us pictures of um, their history, um, which we received pictures back in the 1800s um, of the Black community in Alexandria. We're really trying to get pictures of individuals, of Black businesses, um, homes, um, just because we understand that uh, our collection in that area was really weak um, and we want to preserve it um, and, and make it available um, as part of our digital collections so that it's not lost. Um, you know, we're, we're getting to a point where we're losing a lot of members of our community. And um, every time that happens, um, we feel the loss because we know that their story, the pictures that they have, um, we haven't had a chance to talk to them. I'm afraid that that story will be lost and those pictures will be lost. So um, by all means, uh, please contact us if you have um, family history that you'd like to share. We digitize the 
collection, um, and then we give you um, pictures back along with the flash drive of that collection, and then we try to make that available for the community as a whole and uh, throughout the country. Why don't we turn this back over to Right. Thank you, Lewis. So, what is the meaning behind the title Community Scholars in Apollo? Well, allow me to explain. Community Scholars in Apollo is a discussion series developed and created by local community researchers and archivists at a, a, a get to give a platform to share their findings, materials, and knowledge with and about the local Black, his, black community a community whose history and culture has been far too often neglected. Uh, far too often neglected and erased from the broader historical discourse. This event was organized to center the history of this community by redefining who are the scholars and who is who are the authority figures of the local history. Not only do we recognize the community researchers presenting here today before us, we also deem that every one of you in this audience are also scholars in your own right. And we look forward to hear what you have to add to the richness of this discussion. We figuratively frame the discussion in the parlor to pay respect and homage to the past black communities who have used parlors as meeting space to indulge in critical conversations, mm -hmm. to exchange ideas, discuss the significance of current and historical events, and most importantly, cultivate a culture of knowledge and information, all of which was done in hopes to actualize a future where Black folks can live free of limitations and constraints opposed upon them in the wider society. Today's conversation will be moderated by community historian and native Alexandrian, Mr. Michael Johnson, who will introduce the other presenters and lead the conversation about research. But before we get into the exciting conversation about black and brown Alexandrian history, I would like to take time to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Clark Lewis to share her remarks about today's program. Dr. Clark Lewis is the director of the public history department at Howard University and is an instrumental contributor to this program by way of her time and wisdom during the development stages of this series. After her remarks, she will hand it over to Mr. Michael Johnson to begin the discussion. At this time, I ask for all of you to please silence your phone for the duration of the conversation. If you have to take the call, please take it outside quietly. With that said, please join me and get put your hand together for Dr. Elizabeth Clark Lewis. Thank you very much. Mr. Jermaine Dennis deserves a great deal of credit as a new person here within a month, he reached out to the community and embraced the idea of scholars in the parlor. I think Mr. Dennis deserves a round of applause. Is the mic on? No, there you go, now it is. Okay. Mr. Dennis deserves a round of applause. Before I start, I wanted to make sure that I mention one of the persons who was the co-professor for the class. They're saying they can't hear. They're saying they can't hear. Brilliant. I'd like to make sure that I recognize the people who were the co-professors in this important endeavor. This class be was begun at the behest of the persons who live in Alexandria. In the Alexandria communities, there was a great interest in history and making sure that Alexandrians were involved in the preservation and the, exp and the explanation of their own history. Uh, the team came together at that time with a willing partner at Northern Virginia Community College. Um, and the dean there at the time, Jim McClellan, was absolutely invested in this program at that time. Uh, upon his retirement, a number of other Northern Virginia um, Community College leaders um, were somewhat supportive of the program, but the program continued on. I'd like to make sure that Dr. Averett, 
please stand. She was one of the co-professors who worked extensively with the students. Um, several individuals at the community level have been instrumental in support. Mr. Ken Banks, whose family, the Banks family is a long time uh, resident and their family had a long time uh, company here in the community. I'd also like to make sure that um, Ms. Adderson and Blake Wilson, again, PhD students from Howard, who've been extraordinarily supportive of all the community activities. Ms. Adderson, stand. Blake Wilson, these are both PhD candidates at Howard who are absolutely invested in uh, Alexandria history. Uh, not only did Ms. Adderson do work, but Mr. Wilson's master's thesis was on how was on Alexandria history. I'd like to, in closing, make sure that we remember this is the month that Frederick Douglass was not only born, that he passed away in, in um, February of 1895. I submit that 129 years since his death, programs like this keep the Alexandria community and his spirit alive. Please remember, this is one of the last places he spoke in 1894. It was on Monday at an emancipation program. The Washington Bee said that it was a great success. And they talked about the fact that he had come over and over to meet with and preside over, uh, not just the guest. He was a, in, he was a guest of um, at 606 Gibbon Street, a man by the name of Magnus Robinson. 1,500 people, in addition, came out, and the newspaper spoke of how much he talked about not only Alexandria history, but the issue, as they said, he addressed was called the Negro problem. He said there was never a problem with the Negro, particularly those here in Alexandria. But the problem was America. Was it, was it going to have the loyalty enough, honor enough, and patriotism enough to live up to their own constitution? Donna Wells who was an image scholar and one of my PhD students, and unfortunately she passed away. She looked up uh, many of his images and found one of him at Mount Vernon. She insists, and frequently Mr. Wilson and Ms. Addison and other historians in the room know everything's always not cut and dry. She looked at some of his last pictures and there's a picture of him, an image of him at Mount Vernon. She believes this was a part of his coming to Alexandria that day. And very important for him was that he, as the father of civil rights, took the time to also go to the area of Alexandria, then uh, Mount Vernon. This was, she said, her favorite image of him in Alexandria, working hard to make sure that individuals understand that Alexandria was very dear to the heart of one of the most important leaders in US history. In addition, I'd like to also recognize one other scholar who's done extraordinary work that has touched on Alexandria. I'd like to make sure that one of our PhD candidates, Ms. Yvonne Bradley, please stands. Ms. Bradley has done extensive research that touches on the same points in Alexandria history. Very importantly for me, I'd like to thank Mr. Johnson who tirelessly drove the van, worked in Every, pay, every way possible to make sure that we had the, not only the class at Northern Virginia, but that the class was successful in visiting many of the historic sites. We look forward to doing the class again, hopefully with the support of Northern Virginia Community College in the future. Mr. Johnson, again, our thanks. Okay, uh, good afternoon. I'm Michael Johnson, I'll be the moderator, uh, but first let me, uh, let everyone know that I'm a native Alexandria, born and raised. I'm also the president of Phi Alpha Theta yes. History Honor Society at Coppin State. Uh, so history has always been something that I wanted to dive into. I got into it in my later years. I'm also the co-founder of the SRG and Pastor Lou heads that up. He came a little late. Uh, it's very important that we record the history of the African-Americans and the contribution that's made here in the city. We have other programs we'll be lining up. Uh, Mr. Steve Martin is, is one of the guys we'll be highlighting as well. Mr. Robert Dawkins, who just passed recently, you can see his display in the case of Parker Gray outside, uh, donated by his family, and that's what we need, okay? 
So with that being said, I will introduce my first presenter, Ms. Kathy Driver, on her research on the Ruby Tucker Center. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Kathy Driver, and I'm researching public housing on Hopkins Tansel, which is Ruby Tucker is the community center on the property. Hopkins Tansel Public Housing opened in 1942 and is located in Alexandria, Virginia. I wanted to create a museum. Can you hear her? You have to speak up. Come on. You want to stand up or speak up? Okay. Go ahead. Come on. I want to I want to create a museum that will feature an oral history archives, public housing, public programming, and the entrepreneurship hub. I would like to include restored apartments of three early families who lived in Hopkins Tansels in 1942. My museum will be located in the first group of units in the complex, which currently houses 111 units and it has been open since 1942. The movement for the conservation of a public housing building began in the 1990s. For example, in Chicago, 17,000 units were demolished. Residents like me are leading the movement for the creation of the movements of the present. Beverly, like me, is working to create, working hard to create a proposal for a museum. I hope to include civic leaders, preservations, historics and culture experts who, like me, want to create a new historic landmark to recognize this important site. As the project moves forward, I hope the museum will uplift the voices and stories of public housing residents. I want to create a board for the museum that will have at least half of its members who are public housing residents. My museum will promote the idea that housing is a human right. It will be all focused with storytelling, community development, and many community programs. My museum will have exhibits and collections of oral histories of public housing residents. It will tell the stories of those who live in public housing like Earl Lord and other families I will identify. I hope to bring students and others to help me collect the oral history of Hopkins Tansel Court. In the end, I plan to work with museums across the United States and internationally with museums organizations like the Timmet, Museum in New York, Jane Adams Hall House Museum in Chicago, and District 6 Museum in South Africa. I want to bring new voices and fresh preservations to Alexandria, Virginia. I would like to bring DJ Spinderella to my museum. My museum will celebrate the important role public housing played in U.S. history. I'll quote her, the story of public housing influence on America, music, traditions, and culture is largely untold. The history is pretty critical to understanding how America's must music grew out of close-knit communities. DJ Spinderella grew up in public housing with her parents and five siblings. She can come and speak on her experience when she was living in public housing in New York City. I quote, Cinderella is a legend, and just like she brought people to the dance floor with her music, she will bring people to my museum. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh before we go any further, I want to acknowledge a couple of people that came in. I don't want to say late. They was just a little bit behind schedule. But first, uh, <laughs> Mr. Junior Haley, he's uh, the curator for the African American Hall of Fame at Charles Houston. Ms. Sheila, uh, Pastor Sheila Whiting, who I grew up with, with her husband, Lou. And uh, our honorable councilwoman running for mayor, Ms. Alicia Gaskin in the back. Thank you for coming. And with that, I will move on to our next presenter, uh, Ms. Stephanie Johnson. Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Johnson, and I had the pleasure in um, researching Alexandra Elks Lodge, number 48. Um, can you go to the next slide? Before I talk about the lodge, uh, I think this is the third slide. Yes, right there. We're going to start there first. The, uh, the Elks, Elkstum um, started in 1899, 1898, by Benjamin Howard and Arthur Riggs. Um, Mr. Howard was a 
porter on the on the train, a Pullman porter. And what happened was that a white Elks Lodge member dropped the ritual book. And Mr. Howard found the book. Okay. And from there, um, because Afro-Americans or Blacks, we did not have a lot of different uh, fraternity groups. So they came up with the idea of they wanted to organize because, as you know, segregation segregation was very prevalent and that they could not mingle or entwine uh, with the white counterparts. So um, Mr. Howard and uh, Arthur Riggs, Arthur Riggs, who copyrighted through Congress to have the ritual book um, formulated to them. Okay, go back to number one, please. <laughs> so, Alexandria X. Lodge, number 48. Uh, this Black fraternal group um, was established December the 3rd, 1904, under the leadership of Edward Green. In 1920, a sister organization named Israel Temple 138 was formed, which allowed women to participate in a male-dominant space. The Elks Creed is charity, justice, love, and fidelity. Second slide, please. This also was a hub for the first USO Black Social Club for the Black military personnel. It was also advertised mm -hmm. in the Green Book, which assisted in finding safe Black spaces. The Elks were known to have entertainment by then uprising former performers such as Little Richie, Richard, Tina Turner, and James Brown, just to name a few, for a very low price. Uh, to see these people now, we know, <laughs> very expensive. They pride themselves, the Elks, on, on education and place in many oratorical contests. The Elks Lodge is considered historically and culturally endangered since 2006. It is located in the Parker Gray Historic Dis District. Membership has declined and the building has deteriorated. But nevertheless, the Elks continue to stay to be a staple in the Black community. Thank you. Oh, and I would like to thank um, Mr. Harold Hughes for allowing me the opportunity to um, go to this hub and see it in a different light or aspect besides uh, being a patron. My dad is also an ex-member mm -hmm. large. My mom and myself, we were, um, we were in the tent group. Uh, even though we did not venture the way my father did. Thank you. The next group of slides allows us to look at another group who unfortunately they were not able to come today. The young women were doing oral histories of Chichilagua, which is an area uh, for Hispanics in particular those for whose first language is Spanish. These young women worked hard to do what we call development grant work. They are looking at what has been established in the community, what are the, document, what are the areas of documentation that are available, and most importantly, what are the areas of research that they can bring to the fore. Next slide, please. Very importantly, as this large group of Spanish speaking individuals are moving into Alexandria, they too would like their story included. And these two women, Ms. Uh, Santiago and Ms. Alaya are looking at, as I said, at the basic ground level, what is available, what are the areas that they can then build on in their study. And most importantly, they want to do oral interviews of individuals who are in Alexandria. There is the reality, however, that many of them are undocumented. So they are taking the time to establish as oral historians, 
what we call, Lillian Rubin calls the snowball effect, that as they become more comfortable with them and their research, that they will feel more comfortable sharing their research with these two scholars. As I said, all of these scholarly individuals, there were 13 students that started out. At that time, Northern Virginia was very supportive and these students went way beyond what the college, the community college thought they were going to achieve. Many of you saw them interviewed on Channel 4 television and they've extensively also added to other uh, uh, historical <clears throat> events, including a commemoration of hip hop at Howard at, in 50 years. Their articles not only are, as you can see, solid basis for research, they're starting a really important area of community-based research. This is the reality that all too often African-American history was okay for others, quote, to write it. These are examples of people within the communities, enriching the community's history and engaging the community. I'd also like to ask Ms. Diaz, I didn't want to say her first name. Ms. Diaz, if she would please stand because she worked hard. She worked very hard to get this course established in the community and is trying to work to continue to have it in the community. I do hope the mayor, mayoral candidate will listen closely as the students who want to continue to have the class and who are enriching the class. Uh, unfortunately, the college did not, again, see the merit of their work. I hope you as residents can see it and hope you see the potential. The college's answer to them was that they should uh, then move to the classes out at Loudoun. Uh, as you know, uh, Alexandria is an extremely historic community and to move a community-based class from Alexandria to Loudoun is an interesting concept. Add to it the issue of transportation, et cetera. So I do hope people will hear the many voices of individuals who want to have this community continue to have a community-based class and to enrich the, the activities, community-based scholars. Mr. Johnson, you will entertain questions. All right, so we'll entertain, uh, we'll do a Q and A at this moment, but I forgot to mention that my wife is sitting in the audience and she's a Howard yes. as well. Yes from the engineering department. So I just don't want to hear that. You know, AG, I don't want to hear that one. Now. <laughs> but I thank her for being so right patient here. with us right here. Right here. <laughs> and sharing him. Right. Thank you. So at this time, we'll open up uh, for questions and answers. But again, I'll go back and reiterate that we want to do a series of these community uh, lectures. Mm -hmm. uh, again, Mr. Steve Martin, who was the first Native born Alexander to be on the Alexander Police Department. Hmm. And also hmm. his uh uncle took part in the city. And he's still and he's also the grandson of F. H. Murray, who was with W. B. Duboff in Niagara Falls uh for the planning of the Niagara movement. Steve, Steve, can you stand for me, please? Please. Yeah. So they can see. Thank you. And we're also going to have a, a lecture on Miss Dorothy Peaches Turner, right? So we're going to do a series. Uh, and we hope that everybody come back, spread the word, because this is very important. Uh, a lot of our history has been lost, like stated earlier by Dr. Elizabeth Clark Lewis. Uh, we want to make sure that we start rewriting that history and bringing in uh, information from you all, whoever you may know, so mm -hmm. we can make a collection of the history that took place prior to the sit-in and when we first arrived in Alexandria. So at this time, I will open it up. Anybody have any questions that they would like to ask the panel or myself, please feel free. In the back. Madison? Oh, excuse me, excuse me before you go. Uh, just came in, city councilman, <laughs> candidate, a grad, a grad, a I missed his last name, but that's councilman, a grad. Thanks for coming. Go ahead, Ms. Addison. Can you say your name and where you're from? Oh, I'm from I'm from Howard University, and I'm all the <laughs> And thank you. You, you know. know. Oh, I told y'all. <laughs> so 
<laughs> All right, I had to do that. I'll go ahead. Y'all roll. I'll let y'all roll. What method are you uh, trying to adopt in order to make sure that you get captured the right people and the natural history? And how are you documenting that? Give me a That question for me. Anybody? Oh, anybody? Mm -hmm. What, 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 how are you interviewing people? Because our um, we collecting interviews and collecting memories as my primary sources, um, interviewing the residents and having, um, you know, like workshops and tours and short filmings on how our community hacking tassels plays an important part of the community. Because as of now, it's like you go there, but if you not from there or was it, you know, just coming over from, we'll say like coming from Texas or somewhere, you know, you hear okay. about the great things or whatever, but you don't have a lot of people in the community showing them what is what. So I, I would like to do that, show, you know, like tours and collecting memories. So they can see how great the property that I'm doing is instead of hearing the negativities on the media. Because, you know, you have a born and raised Alexandra who can tell you the true story and not just what the media think because they never live there. Thank you. Yeah. And also, uh, Dr. Clark Lewis back in the 70s, a lot of you as Elgin natives remember the Tenant Council. She's the one that started that program through Northern Virginia back in the early 70s. I don't want to date her, but okay. uh, it was a very successful program because I personally know six guys that came out of that program that lived in public housing that are now, some of them are retired, but a lot of them are managing big businesses. Uh, some of them have their own business. And this is something that we're trying to instill in the, uh, the residents in the city, that no matter how old you are, how young you are, that education is the key to unlocking a lot of things. At 65, well, I think I was 64 when I first started going back because a certain professor named Dr. Clark Lewis wanted to beat me over the head, so I had to go back to school myself. But it's a very rewarding program. Uh, even though we had obstacles that we had to overcome, they uh, pivoted and they overcame those obstacles. But it really was the brainchild of Dr. Elizabeth Clark Lewis when she first came over back in the early mid 70s that uh, we brought it back because it was a very viable program. Any other question? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Ms. Gaff. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I was excited to hear about the offer of the Western Region Council and the Northeast again. I'm just wondering if there are other ways the city can support you? And the program. Start the program. Start the program. Start the program. You do the program. Um, we feel the panel that um because we are like at a standstill, that we need to take a look, this take a look at um the program to make it go forward. Yes, to restart the program and to keep it going and going and going because it's very successful to us and just having that start and then stop in the middle. That's like a, a failure, I guess you can say, to the community. And we would like to see people behind us in the next generations to keep it going. Instead of trying to stop our learning, let's let's keep it going. Could I just add also that as taxpayers, that's one of the things that mm -hmm. I think is important, that you have Alexandria taxpayers and an Alexandria college deterring students. Mm -hmm. They all did well. Their research will stand. Uh, it wasn't just me. As soon as it got out and they had a general, a person came in and interviewed them, they saw how well they were doing. They featured them on television. And, and media can be very, ooh, they were rough on them. 
but they were ready with the questions and most importantly, the answers about why they were so invested in doing their community history. And it's just to me unfortunate that you have individuals who don't share that. And again, it wasn't just African-American history. As we said, two of the women are doing Hispanic history. They're looking at new residents. They're looking, as we say, new voices with a new volume. And they're very interested in continuing this program. And for them to be told, well, that's fine, you did excellent, but we need you to go to Loudoun's, that just doesn't compute in, in, to me. And so I just think that it is sad that um, Ms. Driver is talking about a museum and she's right at the cusp. HUD is now funding studies of public housing. Uh, the 50th anniversary of hip hop said, the first hip hop programs, Ms. Addison, where did the first hip hop programs come out of? How nice stand up, stand up. <laughs> stand up, where, when? Where were the first hip hop activities outside of what? Public housing wow. communities. Yeah. Oh, that wasn't your that wasn't your essay. <laughs> they have a book, and so, um, and as she's, I, I'm so surprised. I had no idea you had done the research on Spinderella, who is a well known. Um, I'm old. Oh, uh, DJ. DJ, sorry, yeah. but she is showing how she would bring Spinderella in to highlight public, public housing and how um, DJ Cool Herc and the others who did start hip hop, they were all doing it outside of public housing communities. And so I do think that this is an important area for research. We have to stop. The executive director of the African-American Museum Association, Dr. Vedette Coleman just walked in <laughs> and Dr. Coleman is the one who has, single-handedly encouraged her <laughs> to continue her research. And her son, Chet, is our heart. He was born in our classes at Howard. Dr. Coleman, do you have anything to say? <laughs> yes, keep up the amazing work. You're not allowed to ever retire. <laughs> No, 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 no. So, uh, this the ruler of the, the else, Mr. Harold, you had a question. Yeah, I, got, I have a question, but I'm no longer the exalted ruler. Oh, yeah, okay. He's the exalted ruler. Oh, okay. Dr. Miller. Mr. Miller, excuse yeah. me. Okay. Question uh, I heard you mention about the 17,000 uh, um, projects homes that were taken away. And I also heard you mention about Earl Lloyd. Yes. Uh, the discussion about Mr. Lloyd, uh, have you spoken to any of his family? That was Amari. Yes. Did you have? Uh, because I'm, I'm with him every day. Uh, uh, I'm engaged to his niece. Okay, so I'm there with his nephews, and I speak to his son almost every day also. And if you want to get in contact with them, I can do that for you. Okay. Okay. And the reason why they're so important, and I am not gonna take too much time, is that you know we put a, a statue of him Charles over Houston. in Charles Houston. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that itself was a mess. Uh, okay. Um I'm not going to that right now because I'm saying that. <laughs> but uh you, you, you know, Earl Lord, as you say, was born in the bird. Mm -hmm. Okay, and he moved uptown. First black player to play in the NBA, first black bench coach, and he came out of West Virginia State University. Oh, okay. Yep. He has now that statue was supposed to bring commerce to the city of Alexandria. But when they got here, just a little history, that statue stayed in the closet for six months before anybody knew it was here. When we brought it out the closet, they wanted to put it in the back of, of the wreck by a bathroom. So if you never know who Earl Lord was, and you and you and you didn't know where he came from, you would never know when they're going into the Charles Houston because most people going in, you go into the building, the Hall of Fame is just on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. That's where you go. Nobody goes back there unless you got to use the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And if you see a statue back there, you know nothing about it. Okay, so we had to fight the city of Alexandria 
to move the statue from the back to the front. Now, most of y'all know doing segregated Alexandria, being in the back brings back connotations that you don't want to deal with. Mm -hmm. And they didn't understand that, what we were talking about. And at one point, we, they, their family almost decided to remove the statue from Alexandria. So that in itself has history. But I can put you in contact with that family if you really want to. Okay. Yes. And, and Mr. And I also was born in the project, so I know. Mr. <laughs> Julian Haley back there, we're working on a program uh, to put more displays in the Charles Houston. And Mr. Robert Dawkins, who passed again, was they were very instrumental in getting all of that done. Yeah. So uh, anybody else have a question? Yeah, I was going to say, um, I'm still white. Chill I was not Houston when they bought the big statue. I'm gone. <laughs> but I was there when um, she said, and I called him Uncle Robert, Mr. Dawkins, when um, the first round before they started the Hall of Fame in Charleston City, there was an ad hoc naming committee. And I was going to mention this to the young lady who's representing the museum, the museum. The ad hoc naming committee partnered with the city so they get the city buy in on renaming spaces in Charleston City. There was the school, the Memorial School. That's the gymnasium. And they were on their way to getting different rooms named right. after notable citizens, mom, mothers, grandmothers who were like our voices in the community, uh, people who were business owners, uh, educators. Each room would be significant, significantly named. We stopped uh, after the pool and, and the gymnasium and the hallway area, the foyer area. Those areas were renamed after notables in Alexandria. Um, Butch and Mr. Dawkins came in and started the rest of the history down the hall. And I would I would say that it would be very important um, for you to continue some of the dialogue at Houston because of the work that Butch put in, Mr. Dawkins put in, Butch used to rack my nerves and I used to rack his. <laughs> but he got, they were forceful. And I'm saying that to you. To anyone that's working with you, if you want something done, mm -hmm. you have to push. Mm -hmm. You can't stop and become dormant or stand still or inactive mm -hmm. because of others. Mm -hmm. Your voice is the voice. The vision was given to you. You get your team together and you force the narrative. You force the work. Butch would come in, and come in Mr. Dawkins, they would come into Houston when they were putting that hallway after the Hall of Fame up. They were so forceful. They were coming, and I didn't know they were coming. And do the, they had the place planned out. The vision was there, and they partnered with the city. They forced their way. They kicked through doorways. They kicked down doors. Mm -hmm. They forced people to hear them so mm -hmm. they could get done what they wanted to have done in that hallway. It was important to our African-American community because we still needed to see us through the gentrification. Mm -hmm. And that was very important. And they also push people to give money and funding. You fund what's important to you, you get the funding. You don't wait for somebody to say, okay, I'm going to give it to you. You go after it. And so they push for the funding by calling different people and having different donors come in and donate the funds for the African Hall of Fame that's at Charles Houston. And then after that, they pushed and they kicked and they pulled nickels and dimes and dollars and Grant pieces from here and there, uh, funding from I think some of the city, some of the city for the Brits to name us mm -hmm. out in front of Charles Houston. Well, Charles Houston is a staple in that community and in the city of Alexandria, in the community, Old Town. And it's a place of remembrance. And as much as um, Butch and Elm used to be there all the time, I am so appreciative because I was telling my husband. I grew up in Alexandria. My mother's house was across the street from Charles Houston, right next to the Alexandria Lighting Company. I don't see it as my community. I don't see it. I don't. I don't. When I, when I walk, go through Alexandria, I don't feel my home. Where's my home? Where's my home? Mm -hmm. That's right. I see my friends, mm -hmm. but I don't see Amen. where it feels home to me. I can yeah. see back home. Mm -hmm. But Butch, Mr. Dawkins, Mr. Taylor, Mr. Andrew Winfrey, Mr. James Henson, Ms. Piggy. That's her <laughs> name, Ms. Piggy. I couldn't think of the lady's name. Notables there, and Mr. Dawkins were notables at being there to make sure that our history remained 
in the central location of Ocean. And so I want to give this to Bush Daly a round of applause. <laughs> Uh, before we go on, Ms. Jacque Plummer is now the new director at Charles Houston. And if you haven't been there, please go up there because what you will see is people that grew up in housing projects that in a 10 block radius made local, state, and international contributions around the world. We have the first Ms. Cheryl Lee, the first certified African American scuba diver lives here in Alexandria, born and raised. Uh, we'll go ahead, Pastor Lou. You had a question. Hello, everyone. First of all, I want to thank you guys for the opportunity. Yes, thank you for the question. What are the next steps? And I also wanted to speak to Scarlet Taylor, the young president of SRD um, after we had some deficiencies on the issue of the Commerce Act and the scholars program which is really a problem as well. Um, it should be continued. You, you're right. Uh, good to see you as well. The energy that came out of that very first class uh, and it was exciting to me because I am a product of public housing. I spent the first 23 years of my life in public housing, not in Virginia or Alexandria, but in Washington, D.C. Whenever I go back through D.C., I still feel like it's home because they always promote, you know, from within some of the accolades and accomplishments of some of the citizens that came out of Washington, D.C., and i like to see the same thing over here in Alexandria. So on that note, the Scholars Program, ran into a hiccup, a hidden barrier, and maybe the politicians and officials can help us get beyond that barrier because it's impacting the citizens in public housing. We need your help. You know, you asked the question, um, Councilwoman, how can you help? Well, that's how you can help. Um, open some doors for the scholars program. The Comcast came in and they saw it, and as a result of it, they gave uh, the SRG of grant to continue different things around and activities around in the city. And so we need help because we're running into hidden barriers. You know, the scholars program is producing and is impacting lives in the city of Alexandria. And we wanted to expand to Northern Virginia Community College. I'm um, not going to call any names, but there were barriers put up. So we went in a different direction went towards the Sheriff Department and were very open to bringing that program into the Sheriff's Department. We can bring it in to the citizens in the detention center, then why can't we bring it to the citizens outside of the detention, of the detention center? So I just wanted to make that statement. We need your help. Thank you. Great. this question to the professor and uh, councilwoman and mayoral candidate. Um, who should we call, what should we do to, to let people know of our interest about this program? Um, at Northern Virginia Community College, within the city, the woman said when they've kicked down doors, they made their um, needs and concerns aware. Who should we call, what should we do, what can we do? I, and, so, and again, we're all trying to be transparent. I was born in William Howard Day Homes in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I think a number of us understand the importance of not just the history that she is, I mean, working so hard to create and to maintain. I think that what Ms. Johnson, in terms of the Tantal housing, what Ms. Johnson is doing is she is literally at the, at the stage of going through records nobody else has looked at. Mm -hmm. But it's not like the records weren't there. I applaud the men of the Elks and women of the Elks for saying we're going to wait on somebody from our community to deal with these records. I know that there's another person that's been trying to get them. People have been trying to get you to donate them. You have said we're going to wait on a scholar from this community. So I thank you for that. What can you do? I don't think there's any question. 
I don't like call. Calls, they take it and hang up. Mm -hmm. If you could write the, the provost of the campus, but to me, it is a college issue. The president of the college should be on notice. I have a sneaking suspicion he's not being, they're not being transparent mm -hmm. with him, mm -hmm. that he doesn't see the merit in what people are doing. People can say it's unimportant. I have at least five scholars in here at the PhD level and the PhD, two PhDs that will tell you they've done community-based history. So it is important. It is significant. I The only other thing I can say, we wrote, the students wrote, mm -hmm. Ms. Diaz wrote and had meetings. Mm -hmm. There's, it's just the idea that the, this, this is unimportant. These are unimportant people. But there's voices and victory in every valley. So we are going to figure it out. I would like to defer, if I could, uh, if, if she would stand, if this, Dr. Coleman Robinson could just speak to the importance of community-based museums. Everybody thinks every museum is the Smithsonian. She is head of a national network of museums. Thank Dr. You. Coleman Robinson. Listen, you Uh-oh, she's from Georgia. <laughs> and Virginia State. And Virginia um, but also, I have a lot of friends and family in Alexandria. So, so what I what we do at the Association of African American Museums is we support and um, encourage all of the African American museums throughout the country. Um, and then we also make sure that we are providing resources. Uh, we also have some African art museums, but they are in the country and then also international. Uh, so what Dr. Clark Lewis alluded to is what we want to do is always make sure that uh, your history is being preserved and interpreted correctly. Mm -hmm. And the only way that that can happen is if you're doing it. And if you're doing it with people who look like you and love you, mm -hmm. they don't always have to look like you. They could be allies, but they have to love you. Mm -hmm. Right. So in order to love you, you have to find your your uh, niche. You have to find your tribe. So when I think about what you guys are all doing on this project, I think, OK, if for some reason the community college is not um, being amiable to what you're trying to do, let's go ahead and have some resources at the HBCUs. How many HBCUs are in Mar I mean, are in Maryland? I'm, from, I'm living in Maryland now. All my taxes are going there. I'm sorry, y'all. Mm -hmm. I tried to do the Virginia thing. Y'all carry guns. <laughs> I did not carry guns growing up. but um, so. <laughs> Well, in Alexandria, you're not allowed to, right? Anyway, I have jokes, but it's not it's not yeah. this group. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, so you have to have um, partnerships with the HBCUs. There are at least four or five that I know of. They're not, obviously, they're not up here, but do, do your due diligence. Go down to Virginia State. Go down to Virginia Union. You have a cadre of African-American museums throughout Virginia, and one of them is in Richmond. Why not have um, a whole exhibit in Richmond and get all of the uh, the the uh, homes that were it from here on down to have an exhibit before you get to Richmond? It could be called from Sea to Shining Sea. I don't care what you call it. It could be up and down 95, mile marker, whatever. Mile marker, whatever, to mile marker, whatever. But what you do is you highlight everybody who came from public housing and have that in an exhibit at the, uh, is it the um, the African American Museum in Richmond? There's another one um, in Virginia Beach. They're all over the place. And I put, I'll put you in touch with them. If you email us at info at blackmuseums.org, um, I'll make sure to get you, uh, you know, connected. Um, because the stories are important and you should not just let them sit. Um, I can tell you, I can't even explain to you how many times our stories are swept under the rugs because yeah. nobody thinks that we are important, but we are, right? Um, and that's what, obviously, that's what Black History Month is about, but we're here 24-7, 365 and 366 on leap year, and I'm sure somebody's going to throw a day somewhere else. So, so just make sure that, you know, you're doing, you're doing important work and it just needs to be elevated. But you elevate for us, by us, by going to the HBCUs. And then, but I wouldn't say put the people on blast, 
just do it nicely because you're, you're going to want them to be partners at a later date because they do have the money. Last thing, Dr. Robinson, just before you walk in, she had given her presentation and she has been made to oh, that the desire for a museum that highlights one of the oldest public housing units in the nation is ridiculous. I would like her to, if you could just tell her that there are other public housing museums online. There is a national public housing museum. They came to our conference this year and had Roxanne Shante speak. Mm -hmm. So don't ever let somebody say that what you want to do to commemorate and interpret African-American history and culture at any level is nonsense because it's not. It's just not. People will tell you every day that you're, what you're doing doesn't matter every single day. And there is a whole National Museum of African-American History and Culture that has shown that that is not true. And our organization helped through decades of advocacy made sure that that museum was there. The Anacostia Community Museum would not exist if somebody thought that that wasn't a horrible idea. So don't let anybody tell you that. You just keep you just keep on keeping on. Go ahead, get your little nonprofit started because you're going to need that. So go to the IRS, get your nonprofit started. Um, you start on all of your articles of incorporation, get your board together. Uh, and there are a plethora of resources for oral histories, the National Park Service gave $75,000 um, in oral history funding, okay? All you have to do is just be a nonprofit. You gotta go through the African-American Civil Rights Network. And they also have the African-American Civil Rights Grant. So make, make, make sure of it. Um, it's not it's not a fallacy what what you're what everybody here is doing is not in a uh, I'll take your question, Steve. I just want to acknowledge the people that came in the room and Ms. Romaine Dawkins and Aaron Dawkins as the son of Mr. Robert Dawkins, who created the Hall of Fame as his wife, Ms. Romaine. And I don't want you to tell them about the stories we've had in the house, Ms. Romaine. But uh her husband uh inspired Butch, myself, and others, uh, especially me, to pursue and collect our history. And uh, when you're talking about an exhibits and all that, that's what we're hoping to do with Mr. Dawkins' research is to let other people see what one individual can do. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have, he always told me, take one person to light that match. One voice. Just one voice. I guess that was song. All right. And uh, also with the Social Responsibility Group and uh, Friends of Frederick Dulles Cemetery and Advisory Group uh, with Miss uh, Gretchen Bulliver help us uh, get, stand up Gretchen. <laughs> she <laughs> helped us get the money to restore Frederick Dulles Cemetery. And most of the people buried in Frederick Dulles Cemetery was born into slave, slavery and then they saw freedom. Our, uh, me and my sister's uh, great grandfather is buried there, great grandmother, grandfather, and all that. So we've been working on that. And Miss Fidella Jennings, who's a member of the uh, in the Lion Green of the uh, the Friends. Uh, so I just want to make sure that everybody know we are doing work in the city. You can join in. You know, just let us know. Go ahead, Steve. Question that I, I well, not a question, a statement I want to make. This is not the first time in Alexandria that we have tried to unite as Blacks. But mm -hmm. honestly, from my standpoint, I see more in here today and more interest in doing that. So maybe we can accomplish a little bit more. But uh, the councilwoman back here asked the question, what she can do. Mm -hmm. We should also be asking the question of how we can support her because mm -hmm. our history has always been we get one black person to break the ring and we expect them to do everything mm -hmm. that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. This needs to be the biggest issue we need to do here mm -hmm. is form a coalition of support now that you see the interest is really here and then designate projects one at a time that we can go after. But don't take on much too much that we can't handle. Mm -hmm. I've heard several things come up of what they would like to know today and everybody saying, yeah, we should do that. I've heard comments. We can't do all of them. Let's concentrate on the one that we can do and do it well. 
I just want to get that make that statement. Out of respect. Yeah. Out, out, out of respect of uh, everybody's time, we're going to start to wrap it up. I, I want you to, uh, I guess, make your final comments and then. Yeah. I can, uh, I just wanted to say thank you again for everybody coming. I hope that the photographer, <laughs> if she could come forward and take a picture of this entire crowd. Okay. Because sure. put to Mr. Dennis as a new person, new young man out of New York, when he came forward with this idea less than what, two months ago, he was not going to get a crowd. He was not going to get people to come. This would not be well supported. So I do hope that people who are here see that people will come and that people are going to return. Please. please. Mm -hmm. they, stand up in front of them, please. Us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's from the side, yeah. Like, yeah. I just want to be in the picture. No. Okay. Yeah. Can we do that after? I just want to make sure that you get, would you please get a picture of all these people? Because Mr. Dennis needs to be able, he's looking to do programs in May, in the fall, and then at least four times a year to focus on different points in Alexandria history. I know one thing that was brought up was entertainment. Alexandria was considered a major stop for African-American entertainers. So all I'm saying is this rich history that you are bringing out is so important. And this kind of a series can be a catalyst to do exactly what you said. So I thank you for these comments. I thank all of you for coming. I thank Mr. Dennis for uh, being willing to step out because it wasn't welcomed when he came up with the idea initially. People weren't going to come. So you have proven the naysayers wrong. And I thank you very much for your support. Yes, oh, thank you all for coming out and supporting us. Ms. Johnson? <laughs> As you can see, I'm following behind my brother's footstep. But um, I'm enjoying the history class. Um, thank you all for your support. And I would just say that, you know, history is a combination of doors. You open one and something behind that one. You open that door, something else behind that one. And it, it energizes me because the more doors I open, the more I take in and the better I feel about who I am as a person. Go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. First of all, I want to thank Mr. Johnson for uh, coming down to Alexandria Lodge and giving that report. But let me say something. We we didn't really touch on it. That Lodge, as she said, from 1903 and still exists today. That's 120 some years of history. Mm -hmm. Black history. And I'm sorry, I have a bunch of questions for you, and nobody really knows about Alexandria Lodge. And what and what I mean by that, I'm not taking too much time, but I have to say it. When we called Richmond, Virginia. Now, first of all, we went to Alexandria. There is no 227 North Henry Street on the records, on the land of deeds. Okay? That's one problem with that because you're talking about segregation. But that's another story. So then we didn't, didn't stop us. We called Richmond, Virginia. And they told us, we know that there is a 227 North Henry Street, but we have no idea what's in the building. Mm -hmm. Okay? From there, we went down, we we, we uh, went back to Christ Church, where we sought help from. Uh, then we got another call to Richmond, to the, his, uh, the, uh, the Preservation Society, which we got that, got put on the, on the list. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to say this, I'm going to leave it alone. Now, you're talking about history. You, you know, the city of Alexander came up there and had a talk with me and, and Brother Miller. They wanted to buy the building. They wanted to tear it down, mm -hmm. all except for the, for the front of it. They told me that if we allowed them to put housing on top of the building, they would do the whole building and we'd own it. I don't know who they think they're talking to. <laughs> Somebody don't know what Last that. year, we got an we got a, a offer from the guy on the corner who wanted to buy the building for $2 million. Mm. Well, we got more of that in history in, in the building than what they even offers because that building is the last building from Black America, a Black Alexandria. Let's put it like that. Okay? I've got I've got history, I've got books in there that date all the way back to 1903. Never been archived. 
Nobody's ever seen them. They, and they sit there, the apprenticeship on those books are better than we got today. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at this point, we've had help from the the Hoff Historic Alabama Resource Commission. They've been helping us uh, bring the, bring the building up. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, we, we also in, are in need because of uh, neglect. Uh, we had, in the past, we had people who was there who said that they're about the grandfather clause. Okay, now, let's go back to segregated Alexandria, okay? Uh, they gave us, they gave a word to them called grandfather clause. Most of us, most of them didn't understand what that meant. So they thought it meant that in order to replace a window pane, you had to go downtown. But they, you know, they pride themselves of being on this hill of seclusion by themselves. When you when you seclude yourself, you ain't get no funding coming in. But at that time, they were three hundred brothers, three hundred daughters, so they had their own money. Mm -hmm. Now today, maybe forty brothers and forty daughters, and this and this big building that had the Hercules job of maintaining. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we refused to let it go, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you, you forgot about uh, Ray Charles. He was the biggest entertainer uh, that was that was in there. Okay, so with that being said, oh wait a minute, I have to. I'm gonna let you go. I have to introduce my exalted ruler. Up the middle. The lady back there with the brown hat on, uh, Donna Wilson. This over here is Darn McMurray. And also, the Virginia State President of all the daughters in the state of Virginia. Yes, yeah, so two two seven North Henry Street is the building. Now, yeah, the is sitting in the back. We're here. I can. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I was just going to say that two two seven should be on the National Register of Historic Places. Because at that point, you can get a whole bunch of money from the federal government, and then nobody can tear it down. Let me speak to that. And then when, probably when you tried, they weren't trying to allow a whole bunch of African-American sites on the National Register. Uh -oh. But now they're a little bit more open. Look at that information. That's a very quickly. Your conference this summer, these individuals can come up. She oh, has okay. in Baltimore. And we'll, I'll help write up a panel. Okay. When you do those kind of public presentations, she can help you. They can put their hand on the pulse. And the woman who's the head of the historic, historical resources at the National Park Service was one of my students. So I'm okay. saying you have expertise. Dr. Averett is in here. She can work directly with you. She's from Alexandria. She can work with you. Let's make these connections here today. Go ahead. All right. So with all of that said, first of all, I want to uh can we all give the panelists a round of applause? Real quickly, I just want to just talk about this space and what it means to Alexandria history. We all know that the 1939 sitting occurred here. And so there's a lot of history and discontent uh towards black Americans in this space, and we're trying to reframe the space to make sure that it is welcoming. And in doing so, we have collections. I wanna just highlight a few things. These are the um, photos that we've collected from the Black Family Reunion that we had last year, in which we're gonna go, we're gonna to try to make this a yearly event. This was uh, at the Parker Gray High School homecoming queen. We have a picture of the Valley Victorian giving a speech at graduation. And this image right here is hosting the school band, which is actually one of the individuals a part of that, is uh, Mr. Arthur, Arthur Dawkins. Arthur Dawkins created the jazz program at Howard University. So y'all go H you again. <laughs> so I just wanted to highlight that. Plus, also, I have put out a Sanborn map for you all to have the opportunity to take a look at. We have a lot of interesting sources here that we we know that is important for the Black community in particular to start taking a look at, so that they can start to. Uh, further out and give more the history aspect of Black Alexandria history into the community. So the Sanborn map is a representation of 1956, where you can look at how the neighborhoods were during that time. And then we also have the historic papers of the Parker Gray District here at this law of library. So if you're interested in doing more research on that, you can.
All right. So I'm sorry for holding those, who, but I think this was a great uh, program and we look to continually do programs in the future. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.